Okay, this is a recorded interview. Today's Wednesday, December 23rd. We have the former finance minister of Greece, Yanis Varoufakis, and the former economic hitman, John Perkins, interviewing together. And I'm glad. Thank you, both of you. Welcome to Organic News on Awake Radio. Great to be on here. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this. And, and with you, Kat. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I thought it would be a good interview to have the both of you together because I feel like what's going on in the world is bringing uh, like-minded people together. And, and I'm trying to bring like-minded people together. I, I thought you guys would be a good interview um, because, right, all this uh, debt and austerity measures, you know, we need to band together. Um, and so who would like to start first? Um, Giannis, did you just want to start simply by telling us recently what's happening in Greece? What well, let me say, since John is with us, that... Uh, uh, the, the kind of narrative which he so famously put out in his book about economic hitmen uh, is uh, one that uh, uh, his readers might, might have been fooled into believing that uh, concerns uh, developing countries, former colonies, uh, neocolonialism confined to certain parts of Latin America, Africa, and so on and so forth. But what the Greek people have suffered over the last five, six years is the kind of uh, tactic that John so meticulously records in his book on the large and in a European context. That might have been very difficult for Westerners to come to terms with 10, 15 years ago, that it would be possible. And yet it is a reality now. I mean, that ultimately is what it comes down to, is that reality is going to set in eventually. You know, the, the re- it has. Yeah, the reality that the it, powers that be want to keep out or try to or, or want to profit off of. Well, in the case of, of, of Europe, let me say that uh, there is a difference with Ecuador uh, and other Places that John knows, knows very well, in the sense that it didn't start off as an attempt to usurp powers in countries like Greece, Spain, Italy. It did not start as a, 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 as a project for uh, um, snatching, if you want, uh, um, raw materials and resources like oil and so on and so forth. It started as a result of an ill-fated and terribly designed attempt to create uh, a cartel that runs through, throughout Europe of heavy industry, initially just heavy industry, uh, but then co-opting other industries such as farming, such as the media, such as finance, of course. Uh, and that ill-fated attempt, because it was so badly designed, the, the degree of incompetence is quite astonishing when you look at it, gave rise to a crisis, a crisis of debt and particularly a crisis of banking losses, which then became, became um, disguised as public debt or transferred to the books of the states of Europe. And, and when the powers that be realized what a mess they had made of, of things, then of course the race was on to ensure that the greatest burden would be placed on the weakest of shoulders, and in the process of doing this, which requires very large doses of authoritarianism, and recession, and depression, and unemployment, especially in the weaker parts of the monetary union, in the process of doing that, a lot of local interests, local oligarchs, found wonderful opportunities for profiting. Right. I mean, so that's basically your answer, is... The, I mean, people want to profit off of the misery of others. They create the messes, whether on by accident or on purpose, not take responsibility, not take the debt on themselves, and just shirk it off onto the backs of those that can least afford it. And the Greek people knew it. 
And Indeed, it's you know, it's, it's a, the usual saying: never let a good crisis go to waste. Right. This is how they think. So, J- John Perkins, what did you want to say to that? <clears throat> well, I think that's a great analysis. Um, I, I, I'm sort of developing it right now as we go along, and with this new book that I've been writing, kind of a new theory of, of modern imperialism and history. And it seems as though back in the 70s and the 80s, back in the time when I was an economic hitman, we were really moving away from <clears throat> taking over the world through militarism. The Vietnam War had proven to be what seemed like a catastrophe to the United States, although certainly U.S. corporations made a lot of money off that war. But there seemed to be a better way, and that was the economic hitman way. So after the Vietnam War, during the 70s, when I was an economic hitman, we were using debt and fear um, to you know, really ex- expand the, the power of the United States. And then it became much more of the expansion of big corporations who really didn't have any loyalty to the United States at all. These corporations don't care. They'll relocate to any country. They don't pay taxes. They, they, they find tax shelters in, in other countries like Luxembourg and, and many others. So, so they're not really, this is not any longer really a, an American empire. It's a corporate empire that grew out of, primarily grew out of American corporations. At the same time, or later, right, by the time the, uh, the Bushes came into power, and even during the Clinton administration, I think it was seen that there was a lost opportunity to make even more profit um, because war brings in profits, even when you lose war. So Vietnam had created a lot of profit. So suddenly, wars began to rise up again in the Middle East and Africa. Militarism grew in what we call the, you know, the developed, the, 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 the economically developing countries and the old economic hitman techniques of debt and fear were employed in Europe. So we had these two things going on, two parallel things, uh, the corporations. And so what's happening today is just a continuation and an acceleration <laughs> Well, today we've, we've got a situation where militarization has once again become very, very strong in the Middle East. We're seeing huge amounts of war going on and in Africa and the threat of war even with, with, with Russia over things like Ukraine. And at the same time, we're seeing the economic hitman system that I was involved in in these economically developing countries in Latin America, Asia, and the Middle East. We've seen that now spread into Europe. Um, and as Janus so eloquently stated, um, it, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's hitting people everywhere, the austerity programs, you know, and we're seeing a rebellion against it. Um, uh, Spain seems to be on the verge of uh, having a political revolt against the austerity movement. Uh, we've seen Iceland take a strong, strong stance that way. Uh, Ireland came close to it, but in the end, passed a referendum that didn't support that. So something very significant is going on. I mean, um, so I was, as I was doing, you know, research and listening to uh, Yanis Varoufakis's talk with the journalist Paul Mason. I mean, it seems like it just right. It always comes down to the same thing. The banks are too big to fail and they're really not like we really just have to just let them fail. And when the people in Greece voted no, uh, they, right, they, the, the country and their government should have had their back and said no too. Do you think that's right? Yeah. Yes, it, yes, it did, Catherine. Yes, indeed. Well, let me, since you're speaking about the banks, let me tell you that um, since the financial crisis uh, hit us in 2008-2009, the Greek state has forked out more than 180-190 billion euros to salvage the banks, the Greek banks. Of course, all this is uh, debt. 
which accumulates and gives the hitmen of the Troika, and hit women, I should say, of the Troika, the leeway that they need in order to turn Greece into a colony, into a death colony, to be precise. But uh, what is striking about the figure that they gave you, more than 180 billion euros, is that this was more or less the level of savings in the Greek banks. So if we were worried about uh, the savings of common folk, and indeed not common folk, or the rich people too, then all we had to do is simply take this money and give it to them. <laughs> that would have right. been the end of it. Right. Instead, we keep pouring good money after bad into a private-owned banking system, which is constantly being used by the creditors, threatening us with bank closures, as they did in, on the 3rd of June. They did close the banks in order to force the government to yield. So, that, you know, that's my response to your particular question about banks. But if I'm allowed to say, to, to make a general remark uh, regarding what John poignantly said about economic hits being more effective than invasions, uh, there, was a, there is a line that I'm sure you recall in uh, Bertolt Brecht's Three Penny Opera, in which, if I, I don't remember it verbatim, but it was something like, uh, why use murderers when you can send in the bailiffs? And let me just give you an example of that, a very practical, very recent example of that. In the last few weeks, all Greek regional airports, all Greek regional airports, I repeat this for emphasis, 14 of them, uh, on the islands of Mykonos, uh, Santorini, and Crete, and Saloniki, and so on, you know, important airports, hubs, transport hubs, they were all sold to one German company uh, against all principles, even of neoliberal competition. Can you imagine that? All airports go to one company. So when we were being pressurized to do this, of course, I didn't sign up to that. That's why I'm no longer a minister. So while I was minister, we were resisting it. And I remember I was having a conversation with a German, a German finance minister. And I said to him, I asked him, in all honesty, behind closed doors, I said to him, Wolfgang, would you ever countenance giving away Germany's regional airports to one single foreign company without obtaining a single share in those airports for the state, for the local government, for the municipalities? <laughs> and he looked at me and he said no. And the implication was, he didn't spell it out, that you know, Greece can't ex expect to have the same rights as Germany. Uh, if you're, a, if you're in, a, in a debt prison, you have forfeited your human and political and economic rights. <laughs> so there you go. But they were, they were put into that debt prison by design. I mean, it was intentional. They... No, no, I don't think that, this, this requires a degree of smartness and, and uh, dexterity, which I don't think the powers that be in Europe have. Uh, I only wish they were so smart, uh, as to have done this all by design. There was no design in it. Oh. There was an attempt to create a monetary union in the early 1990s uh, for very strong economic reasons that benefit, of course, the rich, the powerful, and the corporations. But nevertheless, the intention of that was not to turn Greece into a debt colony. The intention was to maintain the oligopolistic power of those co co corporations. Right. Now, what happens is, if you, if you create a monetary union, that is as flimsy as the one that they create, eventually it builds up within it the potential for a massive explosion or implosion, depending on how you see it, uh, at the financial, economic, trade level. So by binding together our different currencies, uh, flimsily, they create the huge flows of capital from the, the banks of the surplus countries, like Germany, because you have to realize that if Germany has a huge trade surplus with Greece or to Spain or with Portugal, that means that there is a lot of profit, a lot of money, euros, that accumulate in the German banks. And the German bankers then have an incentive to lend it back to the Greeks, to the Portuguese, to the Italians, so that they can uh, charge them higher interest rates than what they can charge in Germany. So that created huge imbalances of trade and of capital, of capital flows, of financial flows. These financial flows rushed into Ireland, they rushed into Portugal, they rushed into Greece, and they created huge bubbles. And then when Lehman Brothers came down in 2008, for completely unrelated reasons, these huge bubbles of debt in places like Greece burst. And if the banks were to take the hit for the bad loans they had given, they would have gone bankrupt in right. Germany. 
So the powers that be, in a state of panic, there was no conspiracy, there was no uh, prior uh, design there, but in a state of panic, like uh, Dr. Frankenstein, who felt that he was about to be killed by the thing he had created, <laughs> uh, they decided that uh, the, the poorest of the poor of Greeks had to bear the burden for it. And in the process, for convincing their own members of parliament and the corporations that, lead, that, that lurk behind them in the Bundestag, in the Dutch parliament and so on, to extend these loans to the Greeks so that the Greeks would then give it to the banks, to their own banks, uh, to convince the members of parliament that this is a good idea, they threw into the deal privatization, for instance, the, the airports that I referred to. So there was no conspiracy to begin with. It was just a conspiracy of idiocy, if you want, of stupidity, of having created uh, um, a monetary union that uh, it, it would have normally taken a 10-year-old 10 seconds to realize that it was not sustainable. Right. Um, and so, it, I mean, it sounds like you're saying not only did they create the Frankenstein monster, but then when they realized they created it, they, they made it worse by adding to adding more monster to the monster. And That's so, right. They want, first, thing they want, first thing they try to blame it on the weak, right. on the poor, on the yeah. pensioners in Greece. Yeah? And then they, 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 they demanded that those weak pensioners and low-wage earners who had nothing to do with the crisis, they are the ones that firstly are made to feel guilty for the crisis. That's right. And secondly, they, they have to pay for it. Yeah. You know, so holding the the um, those accountable accountable is is a constant theme. I, I mean, there's there has to be a way to hold and make the people who are making the messes accountable and 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 preventing them from dumping it on the people that are not accountable. Yeah, it's called democracy, and we don't have it. Uh, all the decisions in Europe, as we speak, are being taken by uh, bodies, by groups, the Eurogroup, for instance, the European Union Council, which are not accountable to any parliament. So think about this. There is this Eurogroup outfit to which I belonged as a, mem as a finance minister of the European Monetary Union, of the Eurozone, so we would meet behind closed doors. Uh, we would make momentous decisions, decisions that determine the future for our people, condemning masses of them to destitution and to poverty and to foreclosures, losing their homes and all that. There were no minutes being taken. There was no live streaming. There was no record of what was being said behind closed doors. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the group itself, does not exist in law. That's why it's not accountable to any parliament. And then we would leave, and there would be a communique, which is which was utterly meaningful, meaningless and vacuous. Uh, so the decisions that a body had taken, which had absolutely no legal power to take those decisions, and there was absolutely no transparency involved in the process by which these decisions were taken, uh, were not answerable to any elected uh, body by the peoples of Europe. Now, those who criticize China for being a dictatorship or the Chinese Communist Party for having contempt for democracy uh, should be told that Europe is worse. So, Yannis, if I could, let me ask you, what, what are you doing to change things now? You, 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 you're out of the government. What, what, what personally, where, where do you see hope? I mean, obviously you see hope or you wouldn't be bothering to be on this show. I, 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 you know, you wouldn't be speaking out. You wouldn't be supporting my new book. But what are you doing? What can you do? Well, since I resigned my position in uh, government, uh, after a hiatus of a few weeks when I was trying to change the policy of my party and to prevent them from surrendering, not failed, they did surrender. So by the end, middle of, or the end of August, I have been on an aeroplane, in trains, planes, and automobiles, as you might say, crisscrossing Europe, 
and beyond sometimes to argue, to argue, to effectively uh, tell uh, audiences uh, north, south, east, and west what, I, what, what I've been telling you now, uh, alerting them to the democratic deficit, which in a never-ending circle of reinforcement, feedback loop, makes the economic yeah. crisis worse. And when the economic crisis gets worse, the powers that be become more authoritarian and more dictatorial, and that's the whole thing spins out of control. The purpose of alerting audiences to this was to forge uh, a kind of mood, a climate, that will allow us, uh, a number of people are involved in this throughout Europe, to launch that which we're going to be launching on the 9th of February in Berlin. And that something is a movement, uh, a movement with a very sing simple radical agenda to democratize the European Union. We call it Diem, Democracy in Europe, a movement. And uh, we are going to uh, start the process of putting it together across border. We are going to be calling upon all European Democrats and progressives to join in independently of their current political party affiliation, their faith, their creed, their nationality, their language, their culture. Because even though this sounds like a utopian attempt, the alternative to binding together across Europe to democratize Europe, the alternative to that is a terrible dystopia. Well, yeah, that's, that's, that, that, that's very exciting. Did you, did you say February 9th? Yeah. That is correct. In Berlin. Yeah, that, that, which is interesting because that's also the date, that's the date that my new book, The New Confessions of an Economic Hitman, is released. I'm very happy to hear that those dates coincide. Um, I would just like to say that here in the United States, we, we, we know we no longer have anything close to democracy. We're not sure we ever did have anything very close to democracy, but we've gotten further away from it in recent years. And my sense is that the, here in the United States, at least, the only... The greatest hope is to change corporations, to put huge amounts of consumer pressure on corporations. In other words, to democratize the marketplace. Because I feel that here in the United States, at least, the, the corporations control the politics. It's no, it's not one person, one vote. It, you know, corporate executives have thousands more votes than everyone else to do to financing campaigns. And I'm just wondering how that would fit in with what you're doing. How? How can, how can the United States participate in what you're envisioning for Europe? Well, it's quite clear that we have to work together. Yeah. We have to work together because we live in a globalized financial village and uh, it is impossible to succeed anywhere unless we succeed everywhere. But we have to start somewhere. So we're starting in Europe. You are starting in the United States. We have to work together. Uh, let me make a couple of points. Firstly, it is quite true, of course, that American democracy uh, leaves much to be desired. This is an understatement. Uh, the corporatization of uh, elections, the, um, even the Constitution of the United States is quite inimical to power by the people, in spite of the beautiful preamble of your Constitution. Uh, having said that, Compared to what's happening in Europe, America is a democratic paradise, is a democratic heaven, in the sense that at least you have a Senate, which in principle is elected by citizens, and all um, of, of governmental outfits are answerable to the Senate and to the House of Representatives. In Europe, we don't even have that. As I said before, imagine if there was, imagine the United States without the Senate, without the Congress, where you couldn't even conceive of a situation where you would vote in your representatives to keep in check the powers that be. <laughs> this is Europe. So that's the first point I want to make. The second point I want to make, yes, you're quite right. Unless, look, the problem with democracy, with liberal democracy, is that we only were allowed to have it after the complete separation of the economic from the political sphere. Uh, during feudalism, the economic and the political sphere were one. So the hegemon, the tyrant, the, 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 the duke, the king, whatever you might call him, or emperor, had both economic and political power. They were one and the same thing. 
But with uh, the commodification of labor and land and capital, what we used to call capitalism, uh, the, the, these two spheres, the economic sphere and the political sphere, were separated. So initially, you'll recall, uh, the merchants started acquiring a lot of economic power, even though they had no political power. They were considered to be very vulgar and dirty people by the powers that be, by the aristocrats. So there was this separation of the economic from the political. And this separation made it possible to confine democracy to the political sphere while um, keeping the economic sphere a completely democracy-free zone. That's the, co the corporation. By definition, the corporation is an undemocratic, hierarchical institution. So what will it take, as you put it, to democratize uh, our economies? Because un unless we democratize the economic sphere, there is no way that uh, democracy in the political sphere would count for much. It would simply be a series of elections that legitimize uh, the lack of democracy in the economic sphere where all power is vested. So uh, the answer I give to the question is yes, you're partly right. I think if we could educate consumers to put pressure on corporations, that would be one thing that would be important. But it's far more important, I believe, to find, to, to think, rethink, from, from scratch, the way in which corporations can become, corporate power can be democratized from within the corporations. Of course, capital is going to resist kicking and screaming any legal changes that would allow that to happen. But we do have an ally, John, in capital. We have an ally, and we should be a bit optimistic about that. And the ally is technological change. Slowly but surely, Technological innovations are killing off the corporation as we know it. They are undermining mm -hmm. the economies of scale, which uh, are the foundation for corporate power and hierarchies. Now, the, the, that doesn't mean on its own that cor corporate power is going to disappear. But we have an ally in this technological change. Um, I. I I, I wanted to just, um, I feel like it's important always to bring out uh, the fact that, you know, where money comes from, what money is 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 made out of, uh, you know, this, this thing. I mean, it's not even paper anymore. It's like all digital and, and, and they, they create it out of thin air and just, you know, use it, loan it out to, to create, um, you know, so many of these disasters. And, uh, I mean, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm just like too much of an idealist, <laughs> but I, um, I just, if, if we could get so many people to, to realize what money is, I mean, I mean, people value it. They're so conditioned to value it and it really doesn't have the value that people think that it has. And it's and it's been weaponized. Like I feel like money has been weaponized. Um, you know, and I just wish that there was a way to get people to realize that that it's created out of thin air and it doesn't have the value that people give it. And it, you know, you know, like like if people could see and 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 realize what has real value like them their power like the greek people saying no like that has power indeed indeed as you said captain it, it it's weaponized in the case of our government we were crushed because the troika of lenders of creditors the european central bank in particular was given its uh, in, instructions from the eurogroup to close down our banks, to terrorize Greek depositors, you know, there are poor people here in this country who have two, three thousand, five thousand dollars in the bank. They've worked for years to have it there, and they're our only cushion against uh, in insecurity. So when they are told that they can't have access to that money, they are terrorized. And this was the whole point of shutting the banks down. There was no technical reason as to why they should shut them down. They shut them down, as you said, as a weapon weaponizing the deposits of the poorer Greeks, of lower middle class and working class Greeks, and migrants as well, who had trusted their money to bank accounts, uh, against the government that was uh, trying to reboot the economic program that had created a, a great depression in this country. 
this is undoubtedly so. But having said that, uh, money is power. Uh, money and capitalism reflects uh, the social relations where those who own a means of production, as Marx used to say, uh, have incre incredible power over those who don't own means of production. Because if you have a monopoly of productive means, so factories and uh, shops and supermarkets, and uh, then there is a majority who have absolutely no way of producing goods, then uh, you can make them an offer they can't refuse. And that offer will be particularly lucrative for you if you have ownership of those productive means. That's why capital is a social relation. It's a social relation of, uh, which is particularly exploitative because of the asymmetries in the outside options of those who own the means, the capital goods, and those who don't. And money is nothing more than the alienated reflection of that power, as Marx used to say. Right. So, uh, you know, and I know people are just con not familiar, like they're not familiar with owning their power. They're not familiar. Um, but now they're finding out kind of by default uh, when, they, when they have to finally rely on their own inner power to, you know, to fight back. I mean, after like hopefully, you know, it's not too late that they've been like so devastated. Um, I wanted to ask you, Giannis, about the, you said that 27 billion on the books uh, of the European Central Bank was written in Greek law and not English law. And that gave uh, you the ability, you, that was like your, your kind of secret weapon that ended up getting vetoed by the, the inner cabinet. Why, That's quite right. Why, why did they do that? Why didn't they want to use th that power or let you use that? Oh, that is the multi-billion euro question. Uh, I'm very, I'm loath, Catherine, to uh, project motives on my former comrades. The left has a long tradition of turning against one another and calling each other names and uh, imputing vile uh, motives on another. I want to, to prevent that. But let me just explain first that which you mentioned what about this not so secret weapon that we had. The Central Bank of Europe, the European Central Bank, back in 2010-2011, in a desperate bid to stop Greece from going bankrupt, the Greek state, started buying uh, large amounts of Greek debt in the bond markets, in the debt markets, hoping that it would bolster their value and therefore prevent or help prevent the bankruptcy of the Greek state. That attempt failed. But nevertheless, at the end of the day, by 2011, the European Central Bank owned around 50 billion worth of Greek debt. So in the end, the Greek state was owing this money to the, CE, to the Central Bank because the Central Bank had purchased that Greek debt. Um, of course, had, this was a very silly thing to have done. The Central Bank should not have done that. We should have had a haircut of the Greek debt since it was not sustainable. Indeed, in 2012, we did have a haircut of the Greek debt, except that the part that we owed to the Central Bank was excluded from that haircut on the basis that the Central Bank uh, was not allowed by its charter to accept the haircut. So we ended up being is a ridiculous situation where now for three years the Greek state borrows from European taxpayers to pay the central bank. Imagine if Arizona was borrowing from Californians to pay the Fed. You only have to state that for Americans to start laughing at the idea. But this is what was going on in Europe because of the terrible design that I was referring to earlier. So anyway, um, due, through the last two years, uh, this debt of 50 billion was reduced to 27 billion because we borrowed from European taxpayers to give it to the central bank. But when I became minister, we still owed that 27 billion. Had we, with uh, one very simple piece of legislation through parliament, uh, actually I could have done it by means of a ministerial decree. I had the decree ready in my drawer. All I had to do was to sign it. I could postpone the repayment of these bonds, 27 billion that we owed to the ECB. 
uh, we could postpone it by 20, 30 years. We could reschedule the payments. And if the ECB didn't like it, they, they could have come to a great court to contest my, uh, my signature, you know, be my guest was my, <laughs> my response to this. Had we done that, we would, th that would have been a, a major, a nuclear weapon against the ECB. Now, why use a nuclear weapon against my central bank? I never intended to. But the point I was making in the inner cabinet and to my prime minister was that if they dare shut down our banks in order to force us to surrender, the least we can do is this. It would not be something we would countenance doing ever, except as a defensive mechanism, a defensive move, in case of being assaulted through a, uh, a highly political bank closure to overthrow a government, to effect a coup d'etat. I had that agreement from the inner cabinet and from the prime, prime minister during the months of negotiation. We had an understanding that if the, the things come to a head and the ECB, the European Central Bank, were to close the banks down, then we would do that. And, that, and my point was that we should always uh, let the other side know that we had this weapon and we were ready and willing to use it because this is the only way of achieving deterrence. Unfortunately, it seems that uh, the majority of the inner cabinet would only agree with me either because they didn't think it would come to that or because it was a tactical move by them to agree when they didn't mean to agree. But when things came to a crunch and the banks were shut, uh, I put it to them. I reminded them, I said, comrades, remember what we had agreed we will do if the ECB shuts the banks down? Do I have your approval? And there was a vote which I lost four to two. And that was the end, of course. That was that meant our surrender. And since then, have they come to you and said, uh, <laughs> we should have used that secret weapon? No, of course not. Of course not, because now what, there is, what has been happening ever since that decision was made, we have a left-wing government, supposedly left-wing government, which is implementing the terms of surrender. The last thing they want to do is come to me and, uh, uh, and show remorse about having surrendered. But How could they, on the one hand, implement the terms of surrender and then come to me and uh, j join with me in, in a lamentation of the surrender? But they, Not possible. they see that their surrendering isn't working. I mean, surrendering to, um, you know, psycho bankers isn't going to ever work. Well, at the moment, they're not even surrendering to bankers, you see, because oh. they uh, all the Greek debt well, all of it, 85% of it, has been shifted from the private sector, from banks, onto the shoulders of the taxpayers. So now they are succumbing to the pressure by the Eurogroup. The rest of, uh, of the Eurogroup, which involves, includes the International Monetary Fund. But to the point of your question, uh, I have no idea what it is that they are thinking they are doing. I have no idea how they, they manage to live with themselves doing what they are doing. They, uh, they, I suspect they have serious problems uh, at the level of existentialist angst. I hope they do. Uh, but then again, the human mind and, and psyche is spectacular at finding ways of uh, rationalizing exposed terrible deeds. John Perkins, yeah, do you have anything to, to say? you want to ask him, Giannis a question? Well... I, I want to say I really appreciate uh, Giannis' uh, evaluation of all of this and, and openness of it. It is, he cuts right to the core. And that last statement about human beings having uh, uh, the existential ability to uh, rationalize things, I think that's a very important one. So the current leadership in Greece undoubtedly is uh, rationalizing all of this. And, and in fact, can use some very standard economic approaches to say, this is the this is this is an approach that will work because the austerity measure program is one that's that's supported by governments around the world right now, and yet most serious economists, such as people in the United States like uh, Paul Krugman and Joe Stiglitz, both Nobel Prize winners, are totally opposed to it. But governments constantly convince themselves that by uh, putting a higher burden on their people 
and by that they usually mean the poor and the middle class or the lower middle class, these austerity programs, uh, that's the right solution. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, the, the, the idea that we as human beings have this ability to rationalize ourselves into believing that what we're doing is right, even though in our hearts and our guts we must know it's wrong, that's a, that's a very powerful weapon that's used. And, you know, I certainly speak from personal experience. And in the books that I write, I talk about how, you know, I, I became convinced that the, the economic hitman approach was the right approach. And part of the reason I became convinced was because it was personally serving me well. So most of these government leaders are being personally probably served well. Like they're, they're staying in office. Their bank accounts aren't being broken into. Um, they're, they're, you know, they're doing pretty well. They're hobnobbing with royalty. Um, and so they're in a position where they, there's a side of them that really wants to rationalize what maybe in their hearts they know is, is wrong. And as, as Yanis said, how do they live with themselves? You know, they must be those, those dark, dark nights of the soul when they, they wake up in, 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 a, in a horrible cold sweat thinking, how can I possibly do this? I, I hope they do. And then, but then they wake up in the morning and they read the newspapers and they go to their meetings and they pat each other on the back and they say, oh yeah, well, this, this is classic economics. This, this is the right approach. And so it's up to us, the people, uh, as Janice points out, the, the, the true democracy movement uh, to stand up to all of this. And, and I, I, I love what I hear Jan saying that, that he's doing and, and joining forces with so many other Europeans and, and uh, having this meeting on February 9th and, and exposing this and moving forward to try to, uh, let's say, re-democratize Europe, or maybe it's just democratize Europe, uh, finally. We've, we've truly been living in the, in the equivalent of something like the, like the feudal ages uh, in, in, during a lot of part of my lifetime. I'm trying to move beyond that. I just... Uh... The people need leverage. I mean, they need to, to, you know, get leverage away from the powers that be. Um, Last night I I interviewed um, a retired Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, kind of, you know, blowing the whistle on a lot of what is going on over here, the handling of the Iraq war. And, and, you know, calling for people like Dick Cheney, just calling them out as war criminals that that need to be held into account. And, I mean, you know, right, because these people, I mean, they're not, they can't do it themselves. I mean, they they just live in their own made-up worlds. Um, and, I mean, we, you know, there has to be just a way to get them out of power and held into account Um, And I just wanted to refer to something that Giannis had said in an interview about, um, you know, people voting for the lesser torturer, uh, voting for um, uh, Cyprus instead of the the Syriza, if they had uh, the choice to be tortured by an, an enthusiastic torturer as opposed to someone who didn't really want to torture them. I mean, if that's what... What it's coming, I mean, that's what, uh, I mean, I'm not going to call it capitalism because that's not, you know, it's like capitalism on steroids. It's like everything is just aggression, abuse, torture. There's no, it's not balanced with any kind of giving, understanding, nurturing, or, you know, heaven forbid, some compassion. Um, and I'm, those things clearly need to be implemented somehow but we need to stand we need to give the powers that be doses of their own medicine by standing up to them and just the people owning their power and saying no um how how in greece now are the people going to still have that opportunity to say no is there still an opportunity for them to say no like they originally tried Giannis well Catherine of course there is and I do every day except you've got to realize that uh, I'm sure you do you, you do understand that uh, we we did something magnificent 
in uh, July. Remember, we were a party that was elected on a vote of around 36%. 36%. And nevertheless, when we held the referendum, the, the percentage of those who voted with us against the troika of lenders of creditors, against the surrender, was 62%. That was quite astonishing. So we mobilized people. They, they turned against their fears. They didn't care about the media, about television channels that were unanimously warning them that if they vote no with us, it would be Armageddon. They were not. They were not allowed to fear fear or to fear the closed banks, and they voted 62 percent. And then that night, the prime minister turned that no into a yes. So it will take some time before this anger and disappointment, actually disappointment is the word that people feel in this country, um, dissipates sufficiently, and a new movement becomes apparent. It's there. It's happening. I mean, I, I see it on the street. I walk on the street as much as I can because people approach me and talk to me and I can see that they, everybody wants to start again. And I'm sure that they will. But it has to happen at an internationalist level. It can't just happen within Greece. It can't happen just within France. The other day I was in, in, in France and I was talking to a wonderful man, a black Frenchman, a member of the Communist Party of France. There aren't that many left. <laughs> The Communist Party has shrunk miserably. But nevertheless, um, he was telling me about his impending um, dilemma, not dilemma, but tragedy, when when the presidential election happens in France, it's quite clear that the socialist candidate, François Hollande, is going to come third in the first round. So in the second round, there will be a choice between the far-right and the far-far-right candidates, between Mr. Sarkozy and Marine Le Pen. And this black man was telling me that, you know, being black and having kids, uh, he's going to have to vote. He can't even abstain because he can't afford to see Marie Le Pen with the ultra, ultra racist nationalist bigots um, winning the president. So he's going to vote for a far right government. That is also quasi racist, too. So this is. Um, similar to the, 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 the point you made about choosing between an enthusiastic and a uh, less enthusiastic torture. It's what you're going to have in the United States when you face up, when you face up, when somebody like Trump faces up against somebody like Hillary Clinton. Uh, this is not democracy. So what we need to do is we need to create um, a situation where we will be able to ask three or four pertinent questions of our government and expect to get answers, like questions like, what are the precise powers that you have? How do you use them? Who gave them to you? And finally, how can we get rid of you if we don't like the way you're using your power? Mm -hmm. Now, unless you can ask these questions of your uh, rulers, of those in power, you don't have democracy. You referred um, before in the U.S. that we have the Senate and the Congress and, um, you know, said that this country still has uh, somewhat of a democracy. <laughs> um, yeah. um, I mean, I, I, I wish, the, again, like we would use it because... Uh, I mean, everything in this country is being uh, corporatized, you know, the justice system. I mean, there's so many people being put in jail. You know, people, they, they literally criminalize people for everything. Uh, sure. the, you know, the public hasn't really, in, in this country, I mean, all my life, I never, I never felt the people know their rights. The people do not know their rights. And if you don't know and exercise your rights they are going to get lost. And that is happening at a, a really an accelerated rate in this country. And, um, it, it, you know, it, you don't want to have to have your rights kick in the minute you realize that they're being taken from you. That's not the time to start exercising your rights. You know, it's, it's That's quite right. It's, 
it's it's That's like quite right. remember. It's like I'm sorry. I'm just going to say it's it's like yeah. you know finding out that you have a hamstring muscle when when it gets pulled as opposed to exercising it. Like you don't want to find out that that's the way that you know you find out you have a hamstring muscle is when it's getting like ripped instead of utilized. Yes, you're absolutely right. So what we need is we need uh, a redo, a repetition uh, under different conditions, of course, and with different nuances of the civil rights movement uh, of the 1960s. The purpose of which was to impress upon people the rights and the power that the Constitution allowed them to have, but which, unless they wrestled it away from the powers that be, they would never have. And you don't have to convince me about the failures and failings and disenfranchisement that uh, is characteristic for American democracy. Catherine, I lived for three years in Texas. Need I say more? Mm. <laughs> uh so, um, any, any, we have about, uh, well, we're going into an hour. We have six minutes to um, possibly uh, just make it a full hour interview. Um, and I'll, I'll just sort of point uh, something that you said was that it was celebrated. Um, like they were, they were beating a sick cow. Like when the, I, I think you, you said when the GDP was, was falling, you know, the powers that be were, mm-hmm. We're celebrating, and I mean, is there any way at this late stage to just allow the banks to just fail, and you know, let let well, the burden fall on them who who it belongs to? Catherine, that is a discussion we should be having in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, <laughs> ten, eleven, thereabouts. Yeah, in Europe. What has happened is they've bailed them out now. There's no question of the bank failing now. Yeah. They are, they, they, there has been such a cynical, gigantic transfer of value, of money, from society to the banks, that the bankers are laughing all the way, excuse the pun, to the bank. <laughs> uh, and they don't, they don't have a problem anymore. The problem now is in the rest of society, because having lost all this monetary, financial, economic energy, the European economy is being buffeted by deflationary winds, by recessionary winds. We have a situation now where even in places like Germany, investment is pathetically low. You have crumbling ports and crumbling motorways, and you have uh, uh, health, the health service, which is uh, feeling the strain in a place like Germany, not just Greece, which is, of course, in the black hole of a Great Depression, but for all Europe. You have productivity growth, which is of the lowest it has ever been. So even by the standards of the neoliberal creed, we're doing very badly because so much, you know, because the staffing has been knocked out of society on on behalf of the banks. Now, this is finished. The the, the horses have bolted. So, yeah, I mean, okay, you should change the locks of the the gates, but this is not going to to solve our problems now. What we need now is a way of... um, Firstly, supporting the weak, giving them hope that uh, the safety net is going to be reconstituted so that they don't have to worry about uh, where the food will come to their table Mm -hmm. the following day, because as long as they fear that, they are susceptible to the ultra-right wing, to the nationalists, to those who cry out that it is the fault of the Nigerians or the Syrians or the Jews or the Palestinians or the Greeks or the Irish. Um, we need to do that, and we need to find a way. There are, technically speaking, very straightforward ways of doing this. Uh, we need to find a way of mobilizing uh, piles of cash that sitting, are sitting in the banks, doing nothing, gathering dust, because they're too scared of being invested due to the recession, and finding a way of mobilizing this, putting it into good use, investing it into productive uses, which is exactly what the New Deal of FDR tried to do in the 1930s. So we need a new deal for Europe. Yeah. Um, John Perkins, um, what do you want to say for um, the last couple of minutes? Well, I think, yeah, we also need a new deal for the United States. I don't have quite the same optimi- optimism about our political system 
the House of Representatives and the Senate are, are, are controlled by big corporations yeah. uh, in, in this country. And so we, we really need a, a new deal here, too. But the question is, how do you make that happen? You know, I think, Catherine, you keep talking about uh, the bankers and the banks, and, and I think what we have to understand is the incredible power they have. One example is that in, in recent months, some major international banks have paid fines of about $14 billion. They've admitted to crimes in rigging the LIBOR rate and, ex and exchange rate indices. They've admitted to crimes and they paid fines, but not a single banker has been indicted. Right. Now, banks don't commit crimes. Individuals in banks commit crimes, right. but not one has been indicted. On the other hand, the U.S. Department of Justice and, and others have gone after the officials of FIFA, the World Soccer Organization, which is really a spokescreen, I think, to make it look like, yeah, the Justice Department is doing something. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, FIFA is not very important to the world. The banks are, but no bankers are being indicted. FIFA officials are being indicted. What does that tell you? It tells you that these bankers have such incredible power that if we want to get beyond the system, we're going to have to bring that power down somehow. And I think that's, that's key to looking at it. And I think what Yanis is talking about is it's going to happen on what this organization that he's working with throughout Europe, bringing people together at the meeting on February 9th. That, that's crucial. I'm, I'm extremely impressed by that. And Yanis, I would just like to say, I, I you know, just wish you the best in that. If there's anything I can do to help, if there's any way I can help bring this to the United States, me too. count me in. I would love to get involved in that because I think this is the crucial movement that we need today is to, is to bring people together in a way where we can break up this power. You mentioned Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. Teddy Roosevelt, you know, back in the early 1900s, did something very similar with the bankers. And uh, that's something that we really need to revisit. And I have great hope that we will because of discussions like this. And I thank you, Catherine, for bringing us together here. And, and Anna, so the incredible courage that you have and the, and the work that you're doing, the perseverance you're showing by taking trains, buses, cars, and planes all over Europe to bring people together. Please count me in. I will, John, and thank you so much for all the work you've done all, over all those years, and Catherine for bringing us together. Consider our movement, DM as we call it, Carpe Diem, the season um, day, to be your movement too. And uh, it would be wonderful to have uh, a similar movement in the United States for democratizing Congress, for democratizing the economic sphere in the United States, the corporate world, and we'll, you know, walk hand in hand across the Atlantic. And um, I hope we can do this again uh, in a couple of weeks or whatever, maybe every couple of months to stay in touch, maybe before the February uh, 9th action that you're having there in Berlin uh, to, to promote it or something. And I want to wish you both a happy holiday and, and thank you both for, for this wonderful interview. And yeah, we, we, we need a new deal for both <laughs> Europe and the United States. Indeed. Thank you, well, it's a, it's a, Happy 2016, it's a, everyone. Yeah. Fascinating time to be alive and be involved, and let's just keep fighting. Thank you so much, both of Very you. Good. Okay, good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Thank you.